I know what you uh, mean. Yeah. So if we think about this child standing in front of us who loves the violin, but it's not enough, they're having a great time, but there are problems. What, how can we teach them to satisfy us as well? What are those things? Teach them how to be kind. Okay, to great. Them, themselves as Good. well as kind to the people around them. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Awareness. Don't shy away from technicalities. Like, what do you want from your, what are your priorities for teaching your students? You want them to have a lovely time, you want them to be kind. Nice How do you want them to, yeah, exactly. Yeah. How do you want them to play the violin? Yeah. It doesn't have to be the flashiest, there has to be a simple sort of solidity. Or it's got to be beautiful, sound. right? Yeah. It's got to sound good. Yeah. We've got to teach the students how to make a decent sound, and tone and intonation are the biggest two parts of that. But you can make, I have seen it, and I'm sure you have as well, you can make up to about grade five level, whatever that is, um, quite a good sound. Like yes, well, that's exactly what I'm about to come musical. to. And yes, you, know, you can. These kids who are I mean, look, you can make an amazing sound on a good violin yeah. without ever sorting out your posture and your technique fully. I remember watching Megu off and just thinking, I don't understand how you can play like that. But this, like, and lo and behold, he had to retire from playing because he couldn't. Do you want to turn the heaters all the way up, babe? Just open oh. the things on the ends. Um, so the tone and intonation are the big two, and I literally teach that to the students and the parents, that in classical music, in almost any music I would say, the two biggest things that are going to make people want to listen to you are good tone and good intonation. If it's out of tune, no one wants to listen. If it sounds rubbish, people don't want to listen. And then the, so that's the big two that I talk about. And then the sort of um, partner for you as a player is the posture that you've got to be comfortable when you play. I want my students to be able to play for as long as they want to play for and not to have to stop because they get a sore back or they get a sore neck or they've got a headache. Um, so the posture is equally important for a different reason. If you're watching someone play and listening to someone play, whether they have good posture or not, is probably not, if you're not a Suzuki teacher or not particularly if you're not a musician, how beautifully set up they are, how good their vocal is, is not going to really affect you as a member of the audience, especially if you're not an educated member of the audience in that way. But it's going to really affect them because they're not going to be able to play the things that they want to play. The posture is there to support them in their development so that they can go as far as they want to go with it. Um, and it's going to mean that they're comfortable or not comfortable. And those are the really key aspects of the posture and the vocal world is is it going to work for you and is it going to make your body work at its most uh, efficient? Well, over the long term. Yeah. Mm. But also the short term. I mean, mm. we've all had students who, yeah. you know, heart, like seven, I mean, it's heartbreaking. Seven year olds halfway through the lesson who were like, oh, yeah. and you're like, are you all right? And they're like, I've got a sore back. And you say, well, did you hurt yourself? No, it's just holding my arms up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really awful. So I think, you know, when we, so when we look at this, if you look at page nine, please, I'll read to you. <laughs> it's all right. Um, in the same way that we have maybe mistakenly listed our life goals as our priorities for living, we may also be confusing our teaching goals with our priorities for teaching. So your priorities for teaching are these to help the children I work with to become noble human beings, to be kind, basically, yeah? Mm -hmm. To help our parents understand that it's the process, not the product of the educational experience that is important. Um, and for me, this is Ed Kreitman, to enjoy the opportunity to be a central part of their lives of these wonderful human beings, my students, who come to share their accomplishments with me each week. So those are your goals, right? Your life goals as teachers, that's, those are his. Ours may be slightly different. Um, certainly, you know, becoming better people is a core part of the Suzuki method. I think if you're not interested in that, then um, that's something to think about more. And then the priorities for teaching are teaching balanced posture of the body, including violin and bow hold, teaching balanced tone production or tonalization, teaching perfect intonation, teaching skills for developing artistic musicianship in performance, which I would say comes certainly in the second half of book one, if not in book two and beyond. 
teaching notes and bowings to new pieces. And there is a reason that that's the last one, is because what you want to do is make your students able to teach themselves most of the notes and bowings to the pieces with help from their parents. You do not want to spend the next X number of years of your life teaching. Go tell our road, he goes, two, two, one, A, A, one. That's not teaching. A, that's not the children learning by ear. And B, that is gonna be all of your teaching. Whereas what do you want to do in a lesson? You want to be teaching how you can make a more beautiful sound like twinkle twinkle if they're all going to that And they go and learn the notes for go to that themselves at home. Um, you want to be teaching the preview for May Song and, Song and um, Allegro, like what are the things you're not going to just pick up from listening to the recording and maybe looking at YouTube uh, or just playing by ear at home. These are the things that you're going to need to know to slot into those pieces when you play them. Does that make sense? And the further on you go, the more you will see how successful you've been. So that's your triple layer teaching, isn't it? Yeah, the triple layer thing, yeah. So triple layer, who'd like to remind us all how that works? So go you're on, baby. Right, your working piece. Yep. And then you, um, um, and you have your review, your review piece, your working piece, and then you have your preview. Excellent. Review pieces. Pieces. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so so the triple layer is not equally important and it's not equal how much time each bit takes up. Certainly not in the lesson. And I'm just going to go to the board. If you were to think about how your time is used in the lesson, that's probably not going to be how the time is used in practice, right? So if you're thinking in your lesson, let's say a child on the minuet in book one. What is your basic lesson plan going to be, probably? So what's the first one? Minuet. Minuet. It's one of the minuets, minuet. roughly any book one. I would do um, long play twinkle. Good. So always we're going to do a bow at the beginning, that's just to yeah. remind people. I'm already teaching. That. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so long bow twinkle. Well, so that's just going to be twinkle theme, isn't it? I'd do a G major scale with a with a maybe a minuet one bow pattern or something. Great. So that's sort of a, a G major scale. So this is like um, preparation for the piece. Warm up, yeah. Yeah. A bit of warm up. Just to get their fingers in the right pattern. And to get their ear in the right key. Yeah. So is this the this is the uh, the working piece, right? One of the minuets is their working, working piece. This is roughly what you're going to do in your lesson. So, so that's start? like maybe ten minutes so far. Mm. Yeah. Maybe eight. Then what are you going to do? Okay. So, sorry. Well, assuming we're going to do some work on minuet one, I would take one of the boxes to do. Okay. Yeah. So very good. Check the boxes. In working piece. Then you're going to hear the working piece, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> so ideally, two minutes maybe, five minutes, three minutes. Three minutes. How many minutes is that piece so far? Thirteen. Okay, thirteen. So what's happening for the rest of the lesson? Like what happens now? They played their working piece through once. Give them a box of the next piece. No, you need to work on the, you need to the work on that they, piece. That they so working suggest. piece, like, sorry, I didn't make it clear. Here, the working piece, three minutes, work on working piece. Maybe five minutes though, not the rest of the lesson. What's not on this list for an end of book one student? Review, preview, and yes. So we might then put preview in. We might then put in review, and we might then run out space. What's preview? Um, they're getting ready for what they're going to need in pieces that are coming up soon. Um. 
So you might have a box around a difficult bar in the, in the middle yeah. piece, mm. and you just say, or isolate that little box. So you know, in Song of the Wind, we were talking about doing the, the song, not Song of the Wind, Oh, Come Little Children, mm. doing the song while we're teaching Go to Not Ready still. Yeah. That counts as preview because they're not learning the piece yet, but it's in advance. So it's something that they're doing, and then they may do a box ahead of that while well, they're still working Go Talent Radio, and then they get the credit for Go Talent Radio, and at that point, their working piece becomes the same as what you've been previewing. And then if it's a horrible mountain piece, like Oh Come Little Children, you wouldn't do anything except that in terms of preview. But if it's another easy piece, like you're on Allegro, you could be giving them a preview for the next few pieces that are coming up. So you might teach them a, a new scale or, or on a, a different, like they need to learn slurs. So you need to teach them a new technique. And you need to, uh, okay, camera people, yeah. can you see that? Hopefully you can. Okay, so actually, how about we think differently about how you structure this lesson? And we think, okay, or bow, review. So this actually is review, isn't it? Review, review, review. Yeah. So if you're doing the G major pieces, that might be, okay, we're going to do, let's say you're, the working piece is minuet two, you might do uh, string crossing pieces. They might play allegretto or andantino or etude. Uh, you might do the G major scale, all of these kind of things, yeah? And then sight reading. So this would probably be like three minutes, three minutes, three minutes. That's not how long it takes to play them. That's how long it takes to say, okay, we're going to think about the long bows, remind them that they're doing long bows, whatever it is that they're doing in those pieces, yeah? And then sight reading five minutes. So three, six, nine, uh, that's 14 minutes already. And then that leaves you the rest of the um, uh, lesson to do those things. That looks like five minutes is in the wrong place now. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. And then we've covered, we've covered you've the made review. sure, especially this baby here, you've made sure that you've got the review, they're refining their playing. And when you listen to their working piece, if it's like, you know, if you need, I mean, basically, if you need to teach more than 15 minutes on the working piece, they shouldn't really be on that piece yet, I think. Or you need to work out what is missing for them teaching themselves at home. That if you are, um, you know, if they can't play it, then you teach the first line, if they can play the first line. If they can't play the first line yet, then you say, okay, well, why don't you just try and work out the first line for me for next week? Now let's choose your favorite review and keep working on that. Because otherwise the trap that you will fall into is you're teaching fingers and bowings. And you do not want to teach fingers and bowings. I, th I, I agree. And I think if you, if you don't um, do that, say, okay, let's just work on the first line and then you work out the rest for next week. If you don't do that, Gets yeah, yeah, and they wait. And and they or wait. It can be lazy, and it can also be really they insecure. Expect you to it can be insecure about doing it wrong. It can be yeah. a misunderstanding that that's what they expect. If you teach how every piece goes, for example, let's say up until perpetual motion, you've given them every note, every bowing. How would the parent know that you're suddenly going to expect them to work out allegretto? Yeah. yeah, and so it's have another look at the piece of. Uh, the document on the Dropbox, which is called Playing by Ear. Because if you're not following that the kids actually really learn how to play by ear, then they can't work out their own pieces. And then either you are doing the job of teaching them notes and fingers and bowings, or the parent is doing the job. Like we saw with Noelle last week, she's teaching her at the moment, she hasn't been taught to play by ear. She's teaching her how the piece goes and then they're memorizing it. That's not playing by ear, that's playing by rote. So it's still better for you if you've got a parent who's going to do that because it means you don't have to do it in the lesson. But fundamentally how they're learning is not by ear.
And I think that our lesson structures can really support or disrupt those those two options. How many parents, realistically, do you think most people, I think most parents teach by rote? Yeah, mm. but that's because most teachers teach by rote. Sorry to say that, that's kind of brutal, but I think that's how it works. Um, Could someone just take a picture of the board and put it on the group, please? Thank you. Oh, I don't want the watermark. I think if you are really clear, I'm sorry, <laughs> obviously it depends, you know, how you're teaching, how you're communicating with the parent. How much practice you've had at communicating with the parents and talking about what's happening at home, uh, how open the parents are with you about what's happening at home, how naturally musical the children are. I think for a long time, most of my kids played by ear because most of them were quite musical and I gave them just a little bit of help that they needed in order to do that. But there were definitely some kids who were not learning by ear at all, definitely being taught by the parents by rote. And I didn't pick it up because I wasn't super clear on how to make sure in the lessons that the kids were playing by ear. Mm -hmm. And that's when I wrote that thing in 2012 or something about whether Suzuki teachers are playing by ear because I don't think that I was really clear about it, mm -hmm. even as a level five teacher. Yeah, I think I've been doing that. Because every now and again I'm thinking, are they actually? And the parent will bring a book in or they've written out all the numbers and I'm like, don't do that. Yeah. I, I get it, you feel you need to, but don't, A, don't break the fingers, especially from teaching sight reading, because you should be able to sight read at your here too. You cannot teach sight reading in the Suzuki pieces. No, no, not at all. Are they writing the finger numbers in the sight reading book? No, they're, they're still writing the fingers in, even though I haven't given them to them, in the Suzuki pieces. And I'm like, no, don't do that. Yeah. I think there are two things. Totally, you're right. I do not, not ever them. want a child to be looking at finger numbers. You know, the occasional like it's a like a three above the top note in O Come Little Children. Fine to remind them. You know, same as like D one the first time it comes up, you might just want to put a one to remind them. I think that's all fine. Um, but certainly not that like every note written in. But I do think there are several things happening here. One is. The parents are often much less skilled than the children already, even by the middle of book one. Mm -hmm. So they may feel that they need the finger numbers so that they can help the child. And that is a double-edged sword. One is you want the children, you want the parents to feel confident and to know what they're doing so that they can help the children, but you also want to dissuade the parents from saying, it's D3, darling. Um, what you want to encourage them to say is, can you hear it in your head? Sing me this little bit. Does it go do 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 or does it go do do do? Which one is right? And then, okay, well, now that we know which one is right, can you find it on your instrument? But obviously that takes a lot longer than just, it goes two, three, four. Um, so it's kind of important for us to know why the parents want every note written in. And I think when you do have a parent who does want every note written in, it's really useful for them to have a separate book from the child six pounds 75 or whatever like really not a big investment um because you don't want the kids to be looking at the thing that has all the finger numbers written in um what else was i going to say about that i think that's it and also it works quite well you know like i had, I had some really bloody good students when i was doing this like it's not the be all and end all but i do think when you do get it working correctly it's magic mm. I had a student, um, you saw, mm. um, Matilda, mm -hmm. who I worked out many times, great, played to me, she played it, I said, we're going to tweak that, it sounds awesome, my vibe. Yeah. I was like, yep, she knew it was coming, she'd been listening to it, she sings beautifully, yeah. um, and whenever I said she was singing something, she would just take it very seriously and sing it very nice, I'm like, I find it. Because she's, she's called Matilda. No. Yeah. Um, but here are the two options, right? A bit like the book six and the book, book, book one students in this book. If you think about, you're going to teach every single note, every single bow and every single finger to your student. Okay, so they finish the twinkles, which we all mostly are teaching the twinkles like that. For most of the kids, they don't know how to work it out by ear yet. They do just need to be told 
you know, you play E1 after E in the breads and then after in the in the cheeses, you just go down the scale. Um, so then you get to like your own, you have this sort of option, okay? Either you continue doing it like that. So it's gonna take you at least one lesson to teach lightly row, how it goes, because you're gonna take them from start to finish on that piece. You're going to send them away to make it better. The next week you're gonna hear it. Any mistakes that are there, you're going to fix with them. And then, so for most children, that's gonna make lightly row like three or four or five, you know, however many weeks. And you're gonna do that for every piece. So the mountain pieces suddenly are gonna become really, really difficult because they've got basically no capacity to teach themselves anything at home. They're waiting for everything to come from you. And therefore you're going to be having half an hour with them a week means how long is it gonna take you to do book one? Whereas if part of your half an hour a week is teaching them, and that's the thing that we didn't put on the end of book one, um, uh, sort of plan, hopefully because if it's working you don't really need to be talking about it by then anymore, they're just doing it, is the high and low game, teaching bits of scales and arpeggios so that they understand the building blocks and how to work out a piece by ear. Right, can you sing me a London Bridge is Falling Down? You know, at this kind of level, at the end of book one, right? Okay, if I give you the first note, start it on A, let's see. Can you work it out on your instrument and just sit with them and help them, but don't tell them any notes? that will really show you whether your students are able to play by ear or not. Um, and you know, hot cross buns like earlier on. Um, and then if you realize that they can't, then you know, okay, now I have to teach how to play by ear because then those students, so then you get the situation like Joe had. Okay, I'm on, you know, um, let's talk about the middle of book one. I'm on Allegretto and the student comes the next day, the next week and they say, I can play Andantino. And you listen to it and you say, that's really brilliant. Shall we just add a bit more emphasis on these notes for the accents, show them in the book, spend seven minutes in the lesson on it, send them away and the next week they'll come back and they'll get their credit. And then book one goes like, boom, 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 really fast. And you know, I mean, I had a child who spent five years getting through book one we were doing it by ear and there were lots of things that, um, you know, there were lots of reasons that she was going slower. It wasn't lack of practice, but at least it has paid off later. She is able to pick things up so much more quickly. And I think that one of the things that happens in Suzuki sometimes is that people, there's a lot of reassurance, which I think is really important, that it doesn't matter if you learn slowly at the beginning. It doesn't matter if you teach slowly at the beginning, that's absolutely fine. It should take a year to learn the twinkles, Definitely, and if you then have a student who learns book one very slowly, that's completely fine. But make sure they're learning book one slowly for the right reasons, and not because you've set them up to need spoon feeding every step of the way, in which case book two will be really slow, book three will be really slow, book four will be Excellent. non-existent. Mm -hmm. And then they'll probably quit. Mm -hmm. And actually, what we didn't talk about earlier, when you think about why you're teaching and what you want for your students, one of the really big things we want for our students is for them not to quit, isn't it? Mm. And do we feel like it's worth our while if we're gonna teach a lot of book one to three and then hardly any book four and up? Is that how you want to spend your time? For some people, absolutely. For other people, totally not. And for most people, I think we would like a mix. And we, But we certainly, like if you think, I'm never gonna teach book six, never gonna teach Ramo Gavot or Fiocco Allegro or the Valdea Minor Concerto, even if they're never going to get past book three, that's really sad. You want your students to play those fantastic fun pieces, right? And part of them playing that is that they've got to stay motivated and interested and excited by music enough. And part of that is going fast enough through the repertoire that they get there. Even if they're, you know, 15 when they do get there. Um, but we've got to keep them going. And so the capacity for them to teach themselves and learn by themselves is a crucial, crucial part of that, which I think is underplayed in lots of environments. Do you not think, I mean, I'm playing that devil's advocate here a bit, sure. but do you not think that after a while it becomes a combination of using their ear and no reading? I mean, it's not one Yeah, one definitely. And, and then, so my question is that when, when is it okay, uh, because we're teaching sight reading from uh, perpetual motion onwards, mm -hmm. yeah, so, so when does it become okay for them to start uh, reading the music when when they need when they need some help, right? And it's taking ages because they're listening to recording. Maybe they recording is 
too fast, or they mm -hmm. haven't got access to it, they're relying on somebody to play it to them, which isn't happening. Um, when is it okay for them to get the music out and have a look and try and work it out themselves? So what do you think, people? Because if we're teaching them sight reading, why can't they transfer that skill to the book? It's a very good point. I want, I want to hear what you think about it. Do you think you would say to your student, don't look at the book? I, I teach sight reading using sight reading books. I don't let them sight read from the student books. Although, but would, would you say to them, but if put that away? If, if they're, they're struggling with the notes and it's just like one bar and you say, that's the bar, yeah. what do you think? Does the note, do the notes go down or do they go up? Or, you know, I, mean, is it, I do if it's a box. Yeah. If I'm teaching a box, I'll put the fingers in and everything and I'll say, this is what it is, this is what's happening. And I'll explain that, but I'll then close the page and say, okay, now you've seen that, let's see if you can get, get it in your head. But I, it is an easy trap to fall into that that bar then becomes more. But have you had that? I think, sorry, I'm not, I'm going to yeah. stop asking you about it and just say what I think. Mm -hmm. I think we're teaching sight reading a way low level, lower level mm -hmm. than the pieces they're yeah. playing. So the idea that they are doing sight reading, so therefore they might sight read the minuets, is completely impossible. Like, mm. by the time they're doing minuets, they're not going to yeah. have done any access to have them. Yeah. So, 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 the, so this is what I'm trying to So the idea that you would say to them, okay, well, you can't figure out, dun, 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 dun. so look on the music, and you see there's a little bit of a scale, and then it goes to that note. You know that note really well. What is it? Oh, it's drippy D. Great. And then it goes to a skip up from D, what, who's that going to be? D2. And then one step up, D3. Brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. So you've used the sight reading skills that they have to work out that bit. But the idea that then there is a trap that they could fall into by reading, do, 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 it's impossible. They're not going to be sight reading at that level. They're sight reading A1. Yeah, one, that's not two, what I was saying. This is no, saying just, this use, is a, just absolutely you know, just, just using the skills that they have to say, look, is that going up? Yeah, so I'm addressing Joe's point about the trap, yeah. which I think is a sort of fallacy. Um, mm -hmm. But but my point to you is like absolutely, they should always be, feel mm -hmm. free to use the books. I think because sometimes you know they might be more visual learners. Definitely, you know, and, then and sometimes they just need a visual. Yeah, their head, you know? and I think that what happens is if they are doing the listening, if they have the skills to play by ear, then it all comes together well enough and some kids will read a little bit more and other kids will never look at the book and it works. Whereas if you have a child who is reading every note in book two, then you're going to realise that they are trying to use sight reading skills too much because they're not making enough progress and therefore you need to up the listening. Or if you have a child in book four who cannot look at the music and work out what the notes are with, you know, for example, the difficult, the, the difficult cadenza in Vivaldi, then you know that you've got to do more sight reading with them because they don't understand the difference between a C natural and a C sharp, even though they're playing a grade seven piece and they really need to. So then you think, okay, then I need to do more sight reading. Um, but I think that generally what happens is most of the kids play most of the notes by ear until somewhere between end of book two and end of book three and then they start to read more and if their reading skills are high and if they're more natural visual learners they will start to make the transition to learning by looking at the notes more and then I think it's very unusual for a book four student to be playing like exclusively by ear um, and it's very usual for the middle of book four to the end of book four to be the process, to the, the point in the process where they start to have to memorize things as a separate skill from learning how it goes. That you know, the Vivaldi A minor, they know the tune goes dun 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 but they certainly have to memorize all that whole page because it's really complicated and it goes so fast that you can't really do it by just listening. Um, and so then by the time they're in book five, lots of my students, I know this is not the level that you guys are at yet, but that my approach to book five is we pick the pieces they're going to learn off by heart, unless they're just those children who just learn things off by heart naturally. Uh, if it's difficult for them to learn pieces off by heart, in book five we start to say, okay, which piece would you like to do as a solo? You're going to learn it off by heart, but they get the credits for reading, them, for reading from the music. 
um, because the, the, the memorising can take so long and they can be playing beautifully and stuck on a piece because they can't memorise it. And again, if you transfer that to the normal actual performing world, how many times do you need to play with that music? Almost never in an orchestra. It's like still so unusual there's only one orchestra who plays with that music. Yeah, almost never in um, string quartets. Almost never in, like, even in a band, they're either playing from by ear, like stuff that was never written down. So if, you, if you want the child to be able to integrate with uh, musicians who are in the Suzuki world, then reading is an essential Absolutely. Skill. And surely that's what you want. You, it's exactly. Not, it's not a question of them being, um, you know, professional musicians or anything, it's a question of them maybe wanting to be able to join the local youth. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that, so therefore, during that time, they become someone who can choose to use the skills that they've developed in memorising things to be able to play country dance off by heart in a, in a concert and be wow everybody. Yeah. They've got it off by heart, it's an amazingly jazzy, you know, like really impressive piece. They've got the confidence they can stand up and do that in any context, Suzuki or otherwise, but they can also sit in orchestra and not feel completely terrified by having a, you know, E flat major piece put in front of them. I think, I, I think, um some of the kids I've taught, I mean, basically the ones that have been taught properly Suzuki, they, they pick up note reading very quickly. But I think there's some that they get this thing about note reading as it's, oh, this is really difficult thing. And you have to explain to them, actually, you know, that's the easy bit. It's playing the violin that's the difficult bit. This is just a quick thing. Yeah, and isn't it it's, wonderful that they don't think the violin is hard? Yeah. They, they just think the sight reading is hard. They just think, look at the notes, oh, they get big. They, because that's not what they're used to, and then gradually, that, and that's quite a nice surprise for them, I think. That it's yeah, actually, it's just and I think it's so, so important. Of thinking, you know, yeah, you know, it and it's so yeah. important for us to remember that most kids hate sight reading, Suzuki or otherwise. Most of them find, you know, this is why on the back of the sight reading books you read and the, you buy in the, in the um, shops, it says, oh no, not the sight reading test. That's not a Suzuki book, it's just like. People are worried about sight reading generally, mm. and also that it's really important for us to take teaching sight reading seriously. And I think that if you do sight reading second in your lesson, and you encourage your students to do it second in practice, that is going to make sure that it feels like a top priority, and that makes a huge difference to how much sight reading they're going to do, because they should be doing sight reading every single practice, even if you don't do sight reading every single lesson. Can I just say, kind of on to the point that I made before about the flat, um, uh, yes, the, the children will be taking on all those skills, but I found I was taught very, very well by this particular child that I had thought he was doing lots of listening, I was asking about the listening, and he was like, yes, yes, I'm doing it, but he had decided to teach himself the duet too by reading the notes. Mm -hmm. And he played to me, so I've worked it out, and he played to me, I was like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I then had to have this, uh, sort of decoupling from his brain as to what he'd feed it out. So now I've worked the notes out, they're correct, and he's telling me I'm wrong. So I just have to video him and say, okay, we're gonna video it, and then I'm gonna play you the music. And then he was able to go, yeah, that's not quite right. He's like, yeah, go, go work on it. It sounds really good, really great. We've done that, all that good work, we took the initiative, but you do need to make sure that even though they're looking at the notes and starting to try and figure things out for themselves, but they are also still seeing it, so they've got a frame of reference. Definitely. Yeah, so maybe I misunderstood what you meant by a trap. I thought what you meant was you can have a student who's teaching themselves the notes successfully by reading without you realising, which, you, no. <laughs> exactly, yeah. that, that for me is a trap that like a year later you would go, oh my god, my child can't play at all by ear. But that's not what's happened. What's happened is there's been an experiment, it's been clearly yeah. understood as problematic yeah. and leading to more problems than it yeah. did solutions it and so then you move on from that and you realise that you've got to teach them more, more playing by ear yeah. and that's actually perfect right? Right. <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. yeah and then the, one more thing to say about listening do make sure they're listening to the whole recording because if you just say are oh, you doing your listening week in week out you may find a year later that your student has been listening to for example the piece before they're on the piece they're on and the piece ahead and not to the whole recording or even just to their working piece you know, I've got some, I have come across students who say they do their listening as part of their practice, and I say, doesn't that make your practice really long? Like, no, it's only five minutes. Ah, oh. <laughs> okay. Then so right, that's so why it's got to be separate. It's half an hour. Listening is half an hour. We are going to have a break. Let's come back at 20 
past. Is that long enough for you? Is seven minutes enough just to have a quick cup of tea and a... Yeah. 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 Okay, great. Well done, everyone. Excellent discussion.